<laughs> well, hello there, motherfuckers. And in this time for the Raw Review, show was okay tonight. I wasn't crazy about it. You know, some people are thinking this is a good show. I think it was just passable. It, you know, still doesn't feel quite like Mania season. Felt a little bit more Mania season this week, but it's a little bit too little too late is how I feel. It feels 50% Mania season, 50% Battleground status. You know, it just doesn't feel like the biggest pay-per-view of the year. Feels like build up towards something like a fucking... Uh, Battleground or something like that. Doesn't feel like WrestleMania, biggest show of the year. Show was good uh, at some parts, but, you know, bad at others. You know, some of the shit on tonight's show really fucking sucked, and some of it was pretty fucking enjoyable. Let's take a look at the, some of these, these uh, moments right here. We start off, and Triple H is in the ring. He's talking about the Daniel Bryan segment from last week, that shitty-ass segment that I hated on all through last week. Um, this brings out Batista and Orton. They, you know, they're annoyed that you know the prospect of a triple threat match next week, um, that mania rather, you know, and they, you know, they they think that Triple H will lose to Brian, and this annoyed Triple H, and you know, because uh, you know, God forbid Triple H loses the match. I found this quite humorous. The whole you know Earth would drop out of orbit. You know, everything would just suddenly stop. You know, it's like one of these movies. All the cars in the street would just freeze up. Nothing Nothing would be allowed to continue. Mankind would cease to exist. All the oxygen in the world would be depleted. All the flowers and trees would wither. You know, we would basically be <laughs> we would be choking to death if Triple H loses a match. God fucking forbid he loses. You know, and I love this how he just fucking went ape shit. Triple H is, you know, quite comical when he's annoyed. He was going, uh, uh, standing on the ropes. I, I've never seen this from a human being. You know, he almost looked like something out of a horror movie. This big fucking nose on his face, standing on the rope, yelling at Batista and Orton. But it was a good segment. There was a lot of anger and animosity. And Triple H says that if he, if you know, when he beats Brian, if he beats Brian, he will be in the the triple threat match. There will definitely be a triple threat match. And motherfuckers, if somehow Triple H ends up in this triple threat match, that is it, motherfuckers. There will be no hope for this fucking company. Could you imagine Orton, Batista, and Triple H in the main event? Do you know how fucking shitty that would be? Do you remember Triple H and Batista at WrestleMania 21? I do. It sucked. Do you remember Triple H and Orton at WrestleMania 25? I do. It sucked even harder. Put these three guys together and you'll probably get, you know, three times as much fucking shittiness. But I don't think it will happen. I'm pretty sure I'm predicting at this point that Brian will be in the main event. And I'm pretty sure they'll give him the belt. I really fucking doubt that he will be walking out of Mania loser. I, I, I think that that would just be insane. Seeing how things have unfolded and seeing that I was indeed right, all this shit bearing Brian was part of a clever, if not very annoying and frustrating storyline that was pretty ill-conceived. It was indeed a storyline, even though people yelled at me, yeah, they're wrong, <laughs> and cried, cried on every single one of my videos when I said this. And they have now discovered that I was right all along. Um, I like this segment. A good way to open up the show. A lot of anger. You know, Triple H cut a pretty good promo here. Enjoyable stuff. First match, and it's uh, the Real Americans defeating the Usos. I, I don't understand this. The Real Americans have problems, and then all of a sudden... Their problems are solved. I, I, I don't get it. I, I really fucking don't. At this point, I'm predicting like a four-way tag title match. I was happy to see the Real Americans winning it. But, but what happened to Cesaro's singles push? 
What is he going to remain a tag team wrestler from another year? This man is reaching his peak of popularity. And what the fuck do they do? They just continue on with the tag teaming. Not that I don't think that Swagger and Cesaro was a good tag team. I think it's an excellent tag team. But then again, how much better would it be to see Cesaro on his own fighting for the world title in pay-per-view matches? Way fucking better, motherfuckers. Way fucking better. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think it will be some type of four-way tag title match. Usos, maybe New Age Outlaws, maybe Rhodes Brothers, and uh, Real Americans. Probably something like that. It was a really good match, though. Very fast-paced, very enjoyable, very good, you know, so far, a, a good way to open the show, tricking you into thinking that, you know, this is going to be a great show, but uh, I didn't think that it was up next, you know, just just like that, you're like, two good things, yeah, we're on a roll here, and then, bam, like a fucking bus, the shit bus hits you, it's like, you know, you're driving along, it's, you know, it's a nice day outside, it, it's nice and sunny, and, and, and then all of a sudden you just ram into a, a manure truck, <laughs> you know, like, or like, just like Biff Tannen, you know, I know we just had a Jack Swagger match, so nice transition there to Biff Tannen, who he looks exactly like, crashing into a, a manure truck, just like in Back to the Future, because we hit the shit, right, like head on, I gotta say. Because it was Sheamus versus Titus O'Neil. Now you might say, Brad, you like Titus O'Neil. You, you, you think he has potential. And I'd say you're absolutely correct. I think the man has a lot of charisma. I think the man has, you know, the look and everything. He's the total package for, uh, for being the next big star here in WWE. There's only one problem with a match like this. Everything. Hornswoggle comes out. How could I forget during my Raw preview not to mention this? But I, I like we, I thought of this right to be right after I did the Raw preview video. It was St. Patrick's Day, so of course they have to bring out motherfucking um, you know Hornswoggle. They can't bring back Finley or Ken Shamrock or somebody who's Irish. No, they have to bring back the midget. They have to bring back Hornswoggle. We were doing so well. It's been about a year since we seen this filthy little fucking bastard. And, you know, uh, this is it. You know, Hornswoggle was okay when he was with Finley. It was funny and everything like that. This matchup was so fucking goofy and so fucking nerdy. Sheamus tosses Hornswoggle into Titus O'Neil and beats him with a bro kick. Fucking lame ass fucking comedy. And it's it's enough already with Hornswoggle with this fucking bullshit. You know, it's a, it, it really is enough already. Here's Titus O'Neil. They didn't even give him a chance to shine in this match. You know, Vince McMahon likes to obsess over, you know, muscles and who's the biggest. And this is the problem why they held Brian down for so long. He's not big enough. Well, Titus O'Neil is pretty fucking huge. He's a tall motherfucker. He's like 6'6". And he's got all the fucking... He's got a God-given body right there. And he ain't too shabby in the ring, you know. If you look at a lot of other big guys, he's not great. He's not like a good wrestler, but he's decent. And if this company is all about looks and the body and all that, and he has the mic skills, which is very desirable for a wrestler, then, then why isn't Titus O'Neil given a chance? Chance. Didn't they break up this team so they could push Titus? And, you know, what do they do? They make a fucking goofball out of Titus O'Neil, having him get made a fool of by a fucking little leprechaun, little piece of shit. I mean, well, you know, what is this already? Hornswoggle has been in this company for God knows how long, and it's the same fucking jokes over and over. You know, he managed to, manages to beat up a big guy somehow, and we're all supposed to laugh. You know, you had also Hornswoggle coincidentally made a fool out of Sheamus a couple of years ago, eliminating him from a battle royal. So, you know, what does that say? It's like they don't care about any of their fucking wrestlers and how it makes them look. All in the name of comedy, which is not even funny. You know, they, 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 they make fun of wrestlers at their own expense. 
and you know, and just reduce their credibility as tough guys. And the jokes aren't even funny. You know, if you're going to make a fool out of a guy, at least let it have a comedic payoff. Instead, it's nothing. There's dead silence. Nobody is laughing. It's not getting a crowd reaction. It's not doing anything. So what the fuck is the goddamn point? You know, something you can be PG without having this dumb shit. No one is even getting excited over it. It's, you know, it's been going on for too long with motherfucking Hornswoggle. Goddamn shit. You know, this is the problem with fucking WWE. As soon as they start doing something good, they have to go ahead and slap everybody in the face. Why are we rewarded and then punished with horrible matches? I, I don't get it. How sadistic they are. Then we learned that Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to be uh, guest starring next week on Raw. And this is a good announcement, finally. Finally, there's a tough guy. Someone that actually matters in the world. Someone who's actually relevant is coming to Raw. Arnold hasn't been there since 99. It will be good to see Arnold there. You know, um, a big time celebrity. So this, you know, this is good. But then right after they announce Arnold, we get another announcement. Scooby motherfucking do, motherfuckers. Scooby goddamn fucking do is going to be at Raw next week. And the mystery machine. What the fuck is going on here, motherfuckers? I, as soon as I heard this, I vomited all over my screen. I quickly cleared off the screen with a paper towel to fucking see if my eyes were deceiving me. But the graphic was still there. It said Scooby-Doo and the Mystery Machine. Next week, on the same fucking show as Arnold Schwarzenegger. What the fuck is going on here? This is... This is disgusting. This is confusing. This is mind-boggling. Now... People will say in the YWC that, you know, this is because it's PG and maybe they want to be a variety show with a little something for everybody. But this is just a fucking freak show here. Arnold, you know, this is a guy for mature audiences. Most of his movies are rated R. Rated R, motherfuckers. His movie is rated R. Sabotage. I believe it's rated R. It's got to be. It's for mature audiences. So why are they promoting an R-rated movie and then having G-rated shit like Scooby-Doo? And, 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 and what is this going to be? Is there going to be like cartoon characters on the Titan Tron or is it going to be live action people? I think it's going to be cartoon characters to promote that motherfucking Scooby-Doo DVD. This is just fucking maddening. And, you know, and then Michael Cole making Scooby-Doo impressions on, on commentary. How old is this man? This is just embarrassing. You know, how can these people live with themselves? I, I don't understand it. Scooby-Doo impressions on commentary, motherfuckers. I, I, I don't get it. You know, um, you have, like... A couple of years ago, Jerry the King Lawler is screaming about a, a girl's breasts. And then fast forward a couple of years and they're talking about goddamn motherfucking kids' cartoons. I don't get it one bit. All I have to say is zoinks. This shit is fucking goddamn embarrassing. Zoinks, motherfuckers. Zoinks. <laughs> fucking bullshit. Then it's, uh, it's Cena coming out, and this segment made me sick to my stomach. Cena acts like a child, saying that he's scared of Bray Wyatt. What the fuck is this, motherfuckers? Cena, a man who has actually bled gallons of blood in vicious matches with JBL. You know, he used to be a tough guy at one point in his career. And now all of a sudden the fucking nerdy little fucking guy who's acting like he's nine years old saying, I'm scared of Ray Wyatt. Uh, what? How? Did you ever hear Hogan saying he was afraid of The Undertaker? Did you ever hear Stone Cold saying he was afraid of Kane? The main event that 
the face of the company is supposed to be the toughest guy there. The guy is supposed to have no fear, no remorse, no nothing. He's supposed to be basically a motherfucking superhero. And and the face of the company, the man who we're supposed to look at and admire, is saying that he's scared of his opponent. Are you fucking kidding me? What is this? This is embarrassing. How does how did even Cena agree to this? I'm scared. I guess this is and this is truthfully like how I feel about this. I think what they're doing here is trying to make Cena almost into a man child. So the kids in the audience can empathize because sometimes Bray Wyatt might be scary to like five year olds or some shit there. So I think that maybe that's what's going on there. I think that maybe Cena is like trying to like be one with the kids. So if they're scared, he's scared too. And the kids are like, hey mommy, he's scared like I am. I you know, hey, what's going on here? Uh, is it okay if this was like a mid card or like Santino saying he's scared of Bray Wyatt? But this is more fucking John Cena, the main eventer, the, the face of the fucking company. Are you fucking serious? This segment made me sick to hear Cena say this. It, it, it just was embarrassing for him. I felt embarrassed for the man. Bray Wyatt cut a good promo to follow this up, but... Cena saying he was scared was just embarrassing for him. Now, people will try to flip this and be like, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh, ho, Cena said he was scared. What a great segment. But there's one problem here, motherfuckers. It's fake. And it's it's part of the show. And to write this into the show that Cena's like a scaredy cat is just fucking moronic. I, you know, as much as I dislike Cena, I, I don't want him to be a pussy. I want him to be as tough as he can be. If he's going to be out there wrestling and being a major part of the show and taking up considerable airtime, I want him to be fucking tough. Or as tough as he possibly could act. I don't want the motherfucker to be cowering in the corner, you know, while he's cutting a promo, basically. Fucking just moronic. Who came up with this idea? Hey, let's uh, send Cena out there and tell him to be scared. It's fucking dumbass shit here. Who fucking came up with that idea? Then it was Brian and Orton in the no disqualification match. This was Orton versus Brian for, like, the fucking 136th time. It, you know... Pretty decent match here. I enjoyed it. I like how he hit him with the kendo stick and traded off with the kicks. Cool spot there, but enough already. Enough with Orton and Brian. This match has run its course. Last year we had it to see it like fucking a hundred times on pay-per-view. You know, it, it's okay. These guys have done all they can do. Uh, you know, Orton, it's not like Brian has a lot to work with with Orton. Orton, the man who only has, like, fucking six moves, he has one more move than Cena in his repertoire. There's only so different their matches could look. I mean, come the fuck on already. I, I like the match, but it's enough with putting these two guys face-to-face -face already. It it's, it's getting boring already. You know, a decent match, you, you see what I'm trying to say? It's like it's enough with doing the same one already. You know, come on, uh... You know, they could do something else here. Put somebody else in the match. They do something. You know, and how many times I feel like every single time Orton and Brian wrestle, a kendo stick is, is in there. It's like the same fucking spots. Just a couple little different things, like, moved around to make it seem different. Then Heyman comes out. And this is what I said in my Raw preview. I, I knew they were going to have some boring build-up for Brock and Taker. It was a video package. Heyman comes out, introduces a video. The video basically says that, you know, Brock Lesnar has uh, beat everybody that Taker has beat. It, it, and Taker is like, you know, those were his toughest matches, his last couple of ones. So there's only so much time before Taker loses. Boring. It's, you know, just lazy. Lazy fucking build up. Oh, uh, you know, well, so hey, 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 hey. How, how do we build up for, how, how do we build up here for this, uh, this year taker, uh, uh, Brock match, huh? Uh, I, you know, 
Uh, I don't know. I'm thinking that maybe we just show a video package and uh, grab some corned beef layer. <laughs> Boring! Dumb! Lazy! Stupid! Come on, let's get something original here. You know, video package, this is it. Yeah, video package, it's okay if they showed that shit before the match at Mania. But this is the build-up. These motherfuckers should be face-to-face, -face, breathing down each other's necks, beating the shit out of each other. Instead, <laughs> hey, here's a video. <laughs> but just, come on. Well, don't even try. Don't even have any build-up, because that's an insult right there. A video package. This is the one of the biggest taker matches in Mania history. Supposedly taker's biggest challenge, and we get a video package. Brock and Taker weren't even there, and Taker was motherfucking advertised. He was advertised to be in San Antonio. I didn't even see one motherfucking piece of Taker there. You know, where did I see Taker in a motherfucking video? That's it. A fucking video. I could go on the network and watch these videos. So why do I have to see them repeated on Raw in tiny little clips? Fuck out of here. Lazy as shit. Boring ass segment and worthless ass segment at that. Then it was Goldust defeating Fandango. You know, I like that they were making, not that I don't like the Goldust character, but I like that they were making him more serious when he was in the team with Cody Rhodes, gave him an edge, seemed like just like a tough guy and everything. This week he was dancing with Cody, which was a little bit funny, but he was acting very goofy, dancing in there with Fandango. Hey, that's what Goldust is about, having fun and winning matches. <laughs> what? Again, just, there were so many fucking lame little bits being said tonight. What the fuck was wrong with Michael Cole? Scooby-Doo impressions. You know, couldn't just mention Scooby-Doo without having to do a retarded-ass impression. And then you have, you know, he's doing all these fucking lame things with Goldust. Oh, win a match and have fun. <laughs> just, uh, just, you know, calm down a little bit there, Cole. Switch to decaf. You know, stop uh, taking speed, whatever it is there, buddy. Um, match was okay, but... You know, I'm used to, I, at one point, they said that Goldust was maybe just a couple of steps below Brian in terms of work rate. You watch a match like this, and it was just kind of lazy, like half-assed here. Maybe Goldust is, like, uh, kind of giving up because he sees that they're going nowhere with them. You know, something, I, I don't know why WWE didn't just have Goldust and Cody at, at Mania. It would have been a great match. Instead, we get this. Get this, motherfuckers. Fucking just the waste. Then it was um, Kane coming out. He tells the king to get in the ring. You know, the whole um, Occupy Raw segment was in, in the king's hometown. So that means that, you know, he's responsible for it. You know, there's, you know, some logic like that. You know, so, uh, you know, I don't understand this. The king... Like, he, why would he be responsible? This is like YWC logic, you know? This is like a lot of YWCers would probably use this sort of logic in life. Anyway, um, they, you know, they, they, uh, he has the shield come out. They're, like, threatening like they're going to beat up the king, but then they turn and they attack Kane instead. Uh, for some reason, not that there was anything wrong with this segment, but... It didn't really do it for me, and it's not like the crowd really reacted to it either. It just didn't seem like an exciting moment. It was just like, I don't know, it's just the, the way how they've been doing things with the Shield. Are they going to break up? Are they going to break up? And now they're just back together again. It's just, uh, I've had it up to here with this Shield business already. They're, they don't know what to do with them. I love the Shield. They're all great wrestlers, except for, like, you know, Roman Reigns is still overrated. Not not terrible, but still not great. But anyway, I love the Shield as a whole. But the thing is, it's like, come on already. Where are they going with this? They were just about to break up. Now they're stronger than ever. What? And why was, you know, still, like, even though it was in Memphis, why was the King involved? It's enough with the King already. You know, this is a waste. How is the king relevant to anything that's going on? You know, I don't understand this shit at all. It's just, you know, not a bad segment, but it just didn't do it for me.
didn't feel exciting. You know, how many times are the shield going to power bomb somebody? It's enough already. Um, then it was Naomi and Cameron defeating AJ and Tamina. I was bored, motherfuckers. I was bored. Uh, another lame ass Divas match. Um, Naomi came in looking like a motherfucking pirate. Yarr, 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 you know, I don't know. There was a parrot or something in there. You know, something with a hook, maybe a peg leg. Ah, fuck out of here. I'd rather go drink some rum on a dead man's chest. You know, fucking goddamn, just the lame ass pirates of the Caribbean shit. I don't know. You know, I felt like she was trying to act like Jack Sparrow too much. It was a complete ripoff and, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I got a text from Paul Birchall. He said that he was insulted here. I don't know. I'm sorry about that, Paul. But, you know, calm down, buddy. It's just the Divas match. It sucked. <laughs> um, anyway, it was... Uh, uh, up next, there was an eight-man tag. Just some random eight-man tag with uh, participants from the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. Big Show gets the pin here. As I said, it's going to be Big Show for sure winning the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. Obviously, he was the giant in WCW. He's always compared to Andre all the time. So, you know, it would probably make the most sense for him to win. You know, what is they think? At this point, what, Sandow will win? Come on. I mean, it should really go to a wrestler who has big-time potential, but they'll probably end up giving it to the Big Show, a guy who should be retired. This match was a little bit exciting towards the end where it sped up, but it was mostly just a collection of clotheslines. You know, just too many fucking clotheslines. All these guys, Big E with a clothesline, Ryback with a clothesline, Henry with a clothesline, Big Show with a clothesline, clothesline, clothesline. I thought I was doing laundry. There was so many fucking clotheslines in it. Goddamn fucking bullshit here with the clotheslines. Let's get some new moves in here. Do something. My God. Suplex. Something else. Inside the fucking clothesline. God. Um, then you had uh, Bray Wyatt defeating Kofi Kingston. Not terrible or anything, but... <laughs> Why does it seem like every time uh, Bray Wyatt wrestles, Kofi is his opponent? What are they doing with Kofi Kingston anyway? This is why I was complaining, you know, like a couple of months ago when Kofi beat Orton. It, you know, I knew they weren't going to do anything with it, and this was the point. Why the fuck did they have him beat the champ? The motherfucking world champ. If they weren't going to do anything with him, what the fuck was the point of that? Then uh, Bray Wyatt, you know, he just beats him. And, and, and there you go, motherfuckers. That that's it. Goddamn fucking you know, just mindless to to even have Kofi still in this company. It's just a fucking jobber. He's always been a jobber. All he is is just you know the all he's worth is a couple of moments to do a replay at the Raw Rumble. Then they're like, okay, Kofi, you know you had your moment, and then just going back to jobbing. You know, and I have no complaints with that. I don't like Kofi Kingston. No charisma, no originality, no nothing. You know, just a lame motherfucker with very horrible tights. Then uh, in the last segment, Triple H wants to talk to Brian. He starts praising Brian, saying he earned his respect. Then Stephanie McMahon calls out cops. The cops come out. They, uh, they handcuff Brian, they're really rough with him. Triple H is acting like he's upset. And then he turns on Brian and kicks his ass. It was a very brutal looking beatdown. You know, um, it, it, it was like something out of the attitude here right there. Good beatdown. Very vicious and everything. The only thing that really took away from it, the, no blood. See, this is what I'm talking about. Even though, like, blood won't make WWE better, it would make it more dramatic. How is it that you could be beating somebody up that bad with hard shots and hard fists and all this, slamming a guy's face into everything, and and not a drop of blood? Uh, it doesn't make any motherfucking sense to me. Like, uh, just a little bit of blood, some fake blood? Come on, it means... The show ended at 11, 18, motherfuckers. 18 minutes fast. Which motherfucking kid is going to be up at this time? Which parent would allow their children, little children, to stay up that late anyway? 
you know, a little bit of blood just to add to the drama, would that be so much to ask for? Because it looked pretty unrealistic, you know, beat the guy up in an inch of his life and that's it. So anyway, uh, there you go, motherfuckers. It, that was a good way to end the show. A lot of drama leading up to Mania. The show had a lot of motherfucking shit on it, but it wasn't exactly terrible. You know, there wasn't anything that was so, like, unbearable. I couldn't stand it. it stopped, except for Scooby motherfucking do announcement right there. Um, I also forgot to mention somewhere in there they announced Mr. T, but we already knew about that. I talked about it during my Raw preview, so we don't really need to touch on that again. Mr. T does deserve it, I guess, in the celebrity wing. Um, yeah, so there you go. A lot of shitty moments, but some good moments in there as well. Making for a middle-of-the-road show. All right, motherfuckers, that's all I got to say. Brawl was acceptable this week and, uh, you know, if not a little bit sucky. <laughs> Alright.